Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In parts one and two of the Old Powers Are Waking series, we discussed the gods of the North and the magic of wargs, skin changers, and green seers. Specifically, we looked at Bran's dream where he is falling from outer space, which we will be explaining more about today as well as Jojen's dream about the winged wolf that the crow wanted him to help free, and why we believe the crow tricked Jojen and Bran into doing its bidding in order to free the winged snake that we believe was buried beneath Winterfell for thousands of years. Additionally, we talked about how Jojen, not Bran, is the one who seems to possess all of the characteristics of a green seer. This once again illustrates George's incredible ability to hide the truth in plain sight by having his point of view characters not notice discrepancies and or contradictions in the information that is provided to them. First, we are told that Bran is the green seer, and Jojen tells us he isn't one, so we are pre-programmed to view all future information from that vantage point. In Bran's case, he is only seven to nine years old, and he is broken and alone, meaning his belief that he needs to find the crow so it can fix him and show him how to fly is all he has to hold on to. So he ignores anything that might contradict this and sees what he wants to see. Coming up in this video, we will be discussing one of the most ethereal offices in the world of ice and fire the Sword of the Morning, including the founding of House Dane and Starfall, and why we believe the first Sword of the Morning was a god on Earth, descended from the stars. So, let's do this. Powers waken, shadows stir. An age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us. An age for gods and heroes. Those are the words of Leo Tyrell, better known as Lazy Leo, which can be found in the prologue of A Feast for Crows. In this scene, Leo is attempting to explain to the other acolytes what it means now that dragons have returned to the world and glass candles are burning again, which he interprets as a sign that an epic struggle is near. Leo indicates that the gray sheep are blind, but that the mastiff sees true, which is in reference to Marwyn, an archmaester at the Citadel infamous for his knowledge and interest in the higher mysteries. So the first part of his statement, old powers waken, is almost exactly the phrase that Corin used while in the Skirling Pass with John. The part about shadows stirring doesn't exactly sound warm and fuzzy, either, but the last part is what we're going to concentrate on for the moment. He said, an age for gods and heroes. This brings us back to the founding of House Dane. One of the oldest and proudest houses in the Seven Kingdoms, the Danes raised their castle on an island where the Torrentine broadens to meet the Summer Sea. From here, the Danes ruled over the western mountains in Dorne as kings of the Torrentine and lords of Starfall. According to legend, the first Dane was said to have tracked the path of a fallen star to the location Starfall now sits, where he found a magic stone. Now, this legend is typically glossed over when talking about House Dane, like, oh yeah, he followed the track of a fallen star. And then we move on. But let's stop and think about what that actually means for a minute. First of all, how could a man, presumably on horseback, follow a falling star that would have to be traveling tens of thousands of miles per hour? Yes, it would leave a trail behind it. 
But Starfall is positioned on the coast, at the mouth of a treacherous river in the mountains, which means it's windy there, so it wouldn't last very long. Then let's take into account the fact that when a meteor, which is likely what the falling star actually was, hits the ground, it often hits with the explosive force of a small nuclear bomb. That leaves only two possible explanations for how this went down. The first possibility is that the First Dane just so happened to have been traveling alone in the very inhospitable region at the mouth of the Torrentine, or in the mountains nearby, placing him close enough to where Starfall currently sits when the star fell to have first miraculously survived what had to have been a massive explosion. Then, instead of counting his blessings and getting the heck out of there, he decided to follow the path of the star towards this massive explosion, into what had to be a gigantic fire that wasn't even a normal fire, it was a fire started by a meteor, which is so hot that it lit a piece of space rock on fire. Then he gets to the river, which would most likely be boiling from the heat of the explosion, so he decided to swim across this treacherous, rapidly moving, boiling water to the island where Starfall now sits where he found some magic stone. The second possibility, and the more likely in our opinion, is that he literally followed the path of the fallen star and landed right behind it. In the world George R. R. Martin has created, many of the gods are associated with stars. For example, according to the seven-pointed star, which is the seven's oldest text, the seven themselves had once walked the hills of Indalos in human form. It also states, the father reached his hand into the heavens and pulled down seven stars and placed them on Hugor Hill's brow to make his glowing crown. The Dothraki believe that the stars are actually a great herd of horses made of fire that gallop across the sky by night. They also believe that when a horse lord dies, he and his horse are to be burned beneath the open sky, so he may rise on his fiery steed to take his place among the stars. The more fiercely the man burned in life, the brighter his star will shine in the sky. In Yiti, legends claim that for 10,000 years the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the god on earth until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebears. There are numerous other examples, but this particular legend illustrates the correlation most directly, as the god on earth ascended to the stars to join his ancestors, which makes it pretty clear that his godly ancestors are from the stars. It also appears from a thought that John has in A Storm of Swords, that their world has twelve houses of heaven, each ruled by a god in the form of a constellation or a star. So many stars, he thought, as he trudged up the slope through the pines and firs and ash. Maester Lewin had taught him his stars as a boy in Winterfell. He had learned the names of the twelve houses of heaven and the rulers of each. He could find the seven wanderers sacred to the faith. He was old friends with the Ice Dragon, the Shadow Cat, the Moon Maid, and the Sword of the Morning. The biggest and brightest star in their sky just so happens to be part of the Sword of the Morning constellation, and is described by John as a bright white star blazing like a diamond in the dawn. Based on its description and where it is located in the sky, which is in the south, this bright white star has a mirror in the real world called Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in our sky, not to be confused with the North Star, as Sirius is much farther south. In actuality, Sirius is a binary star system, meaning there are really two stars in which one revolves around the other, which are referred to as Sirius A and Sirius B. Since ancient times, and across multiple civilizations, Sirius has been surrounded with a mysterious lore. Mystery schools, 
which are organizations dedicated to preserving and perpetuating ancient wisdom, consider it to be the quote-unquote sun behind the sun, and therefore the true source of our sun's potency. The ancients believed that our sun's warmth keeps the physical world alive, while Sirius keeps the spiritual world alive. It is the quote-unquote real light shining in the east, the spiritual light, whereas the sun only illuminates the physical world. Sirius is part of a constellation called Canis Major, which is Latin and translates to Greater Dog. On several occasions, George R. R. Martin has commented that the name he chooses for a character is something that he must have figured out before he can proceed. So in taking this fact into consideration, it stands to reason that the name of this constellation was the inspiration for the surname Dane. Think about it. What does greater dog make you think of? The first thing that popped into my head when I first read it was Great Dane, as in House Dane. To make things even a little more interesting, due to the fact that it is much dimmer, Sirius B has been dubbed the darker star of the Sirius binary system. Dark star, anyone? Another parallel between House Dane and Sirius can be found in Egyptian history. In ancient Egypt, circa 3000 BC, Sirius's return at dawn after its 70-day hiatus in the daytime sky coincided with the annual flooding of the Nile River, the lifeline of Egypt then as today. Now, as mentioned, Starfall is located on an island in the mouth of the Torrentine River. The word torrent is a noun, which is defined by Merriam-Webster as a tumultuous outpouring, and is synonymous with the word flood. So, Sirius's connection to the annual flooding of the Nile could have been where George drew inspiration for the name of the Torrentine River. All right, let's bring this back to our story. Given the religious ties to the stars in both our world and the world George created for us, as well as the legend of House Dane's founding, we believe the first Dane was a god on Earth. And given House Dane's verifiable tie to the constellation the Sword of the Morning, as those who are deemed worthy of carrying their ancestral sword are given that very title, it seems likely the first Dane descended from that particular star system. This once again ties into the religious belief system of ancient Egypt. According to the pyramid texts, which are the oldest surviving religious writings in our world, ancient Egyptians believed their gods descended from Sirius and the three stars that are now considered Orion's belt. House Dane's coat of arms is a white sword and a falling star crossed on lilac. The color purple is a rarely occurring color in nature, and as a result is often seen as having a sacred meaning. Lilac, which is obviously a shade of purple, is associated with Easter, rebirth, and the spring equinox, making it symbolically linked with the end of winter. The falling star on the Dane coat of arms is an eight-pointed star, which in ancient mythology represents the god of heaven. Lastly, the white sword is clearly a depiction of Dawn, House Dane's ancestral sword. But before we discuss Dawn, we are going to first read a passage containing what we believe is yet another pearl of wisdom from Old Nan in A Game of Thrones, Bran 4. In that darkness, the others came for the first time, she said as her needles went click, click, click. They were cold things, dead things, that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun, and every creature with hot blood in its veins. They swept over holdfasts and cities and kingdoms, felled heroes and armies by the score, riding their pale dead horses and leading hosts of the slain. All the swords of men could not stay their advance, and even maidens and suckling babes found no pity in them. There's one line there that really stands out. She said, 
all the swords of men could not stay their advance, which implies that the weapons made by men were unable to stop them. Now let's take a look at Dawn. Dawn is the single most unique weapon in our story. It seems to have all the properties traditionally seen in Valyrian steel, except the blade is pure white, like the color of milk glass, and Ned described it as being, quote-unquote, alive with light. Legend claims that Dawn was forged from the heart of a fallen star, but as we mentioned earlier, there's really no such thing as an actual falling star, as stars are massive, and if a star actually did hit a planet, the planet would no longer exist afterwards. Yet based on the description of Dawn and the bright white star in the hilt of the Sword of the Morning constellation, the two seem to match up quite nicely. The star is bright and white. Dawn is bright and white. Stars could easily be described as being alive with light, which is exactly how Ned described Dawn. But how could a man forge a sword out of a star that is likely light years away? Well, obviously he couldn't. But a god descended from that star just might show up with a godly weapon in tow. I do realize that seems maybe a little bit crazy, but think about it for a minute. Dawn is thousands of years old. It is treated in a manner unlike any other ancestral sword in our story. House Dane does not pass Dawn down from father to son, like every other house does in the story. Only members of House Dane that are deemed worthy of it are granted its use, and are given the title Sword of the Morning. Its treatment and unique properties tell us that there is obviously something very special about Dawn. When asked who would win a single combat between Arthur Dane and Barristan Selmy, George R. R. Martin's response seems to confirm that Dawn is a very special weapon. George said, Dane, if he was armed with Dawn. If both men had equivalent weaponry, it might be a toss-up. That indicates that if Arthur had Dawn, it doesn't matter what Barristan was holding, because it would not be Dawn's equivalent, and Arthur would win. That is why House Dane treats Dawn the way it does. One does not grant the use of a god's weapon to someone solely based on birthright. You have to be worthy of that weapon, and therefore worthy of the office that comes with it. George R. R. Martin refers to the Sword of the Morning as an office, and offices have sworn responsibilities and duties, and one would imagine that an office that includes the use of a god's weapon carries with it most, if not all, of the responsibilities of the god whose weapon you have been bestowed with. In this case, we believe it falls on the Sword of the Morning to lead the defense of mankind in the godly war to come which, historically speaking, culminated in the original Night's Watch being led to victory by a hero wielding a sword called Lightbringer in what became known as the Battle for the Dawn. George has stated that he drew inspiration for the Night's Watch from the Knights Templar, whose cross pate is an eight-pointed star, which brings us back to House Dane. House Dane's sigil bears a white sword in an eight-pointed falling star, giving us two links between House Dane and the Night's Watch in the Long Night. The white sword being representative of Dawn, which legend refers to as Lightbringer, and the eight-pointed star being symbolic of the Order of the Night's Watch, which was founded during the first Long Night to guard the realms of men. When asked about Dawn's whereabouts, George R. R. Martin stated, Dawn shall remain at Starfall until a new Sword of the Morning shall arise. John is a Hebrew name, which means Jehovah has given, or Jehovah's gift, which really means God has given, or God's gift. John died, but will arise as the new Sword of the Morning. The old powers are waking indeed. Yes, John. It need not be for long. 
only until such time as the garrison returns. Donald chose you, and Corn Halfan before him. Lord Commander Mormont made you his steward. You are a son of Winterfell, a nephew of Benjen Stark. It must be you, or no one. The wall is yours, Jon Snow. <laughs>